Hi everybody, thanks for attending today. Uh, we're excited to get started. Uh, my name is Sarah Campbell. I work in marketing for Squire and I just wanted to give you a quick introduction on our presenter today uh, as well as cover just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we'll start with those just short little housekeeping items. If you look in the question and answer area, you'll see a few posts from me. Uh, and those are just links that might be helpful to you, whether you want to sign up for our regular newsletter uh, that includes all of our uh, COVID-19 business impact resources. There's also a link to an upcoming event uh, that will be next week on the 14th. That's also covering some of the major provisions in the CARES Act. Uh, there's a link there to an article written by next week's presenter. And then most importantly, we have a link to a request form if your uh, company is in any need of additional assistance. Uh, you can just easily fill out this form and it will be uh, addressed and we'll get back with you within 24 hours of that submission. Um, our presenter today is Dwayne Ace. Uh, he is one of our advisory partners. Dwayne is one of our most diverse partners. He brings a significant depth of experience to tax audit systems uh, and wealth management. He has both a bachelor's of science and master's of accountancy degree with an emphasis in taxation from Brigham Young University and has been in public practice for 25 years. With his knowledge and vast experience, he can converse with clients on almost any aspect of their business or their personal financial situation. He's a trusted business advisor and passionate about helping clients set and meet their financial goals. He wants to create he wants his clients to retire in style, not only financially, but also in all aspects of their lives. He's passionate about family, hiking, running, backpacking, hunting, fishing, playing the piano, speaking Spanish. Uh, Duane was tasked by Squire to understand and train employees and the public on the CARES Act. We also have Megan, who is one of our advisory partners, and she is going to be working behind the scenes a little bit. She'll be helping to address your questions along the way and to provide any support that she can. She also manages the submissions that come in from that request form I mentioned in the Q&A announcements. Uh, she'll ensure that those are addressed. So um, we're, we're happy to have Megan here as well. And we'll go ahead and turn things over to Duane. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, have him take on over. All right, uh, welcome to everybody that's participating in this webinar. We're excited to uh, have this and um, appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you about the CARES Act. Hopefully uh, this will be very informative for you. For a lot of you, you may already know the basics of the CARES Act and the, the, in particular a couple of the loan provisions that are offered there. Um, but what I hope to do is get through the basics uh, fairly quickly and then get into some of the specifics uh, and hopefully answer any questions that you might have that we can help you out with. Um, we at the end of this, we'll have some question and answer and we'll go as long as you need us to. And um, so we hope that you stay on the line and and really use us at, to your benefit. Um, as you can see, I, I wanted to say this is Marty Stauffer's Wild America. Welcome. So if, you, if you're familiar with uh, Marty Stauffer's Wild America, uh, he was a fan of mine growing up and uh, that's kind of what it looks like behind me. So um, anyway, without uh, further ado, I'll get going into this and keep those questions coming and um, we'll go from there. So basically uh, what we are wanted to talk about primarily are the two loan provisions that everybody's excited about. Um, right now it's the Paycheck Protection Program and the Economic Injury and Disaster Loan loans that are available to small businesses. And um, so what we're going to do is go into the Paycheck Protection Program with um, some detail. So first of all, it's available to uh, small businesses with five, less than 500 employees, independent contractors, sole proprietors, and a few others. Um, the companies, these companies need to have been in business by February 15th and had employees as of that date. Um, 
There are some a few exceptions. The primary exception to this rule is the companies that are dealing in the accommodation food services industry. If they have more than 500 in total, but they have fewer than 500 in any specific location, each location is available, has this uh, the Paycheck Protection Program available to them. Um, so what are the loan terms and the amounts? Um, the loans can be up to $10 million and it's based on two and a half times a company's average monthly payroll. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit in, in just a second. The interest rate is at 1%. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention was um, we are doing this as a service to you know, the, the general public and our clients, and uh, there's been a lot of changes over the past couple of weeks regarding the CARES Act. Uh, they've sent out final regs that weren't quite final, that had a lot of confusing uh, verbiage in it, and so there's been a lot of different um, interpretations of the law. Um, so. And so right now there's a lot of petitions out there to have the SBA clarify some of these positions, but a lot of it is surrounded about this, the calculation, the average monthly payroll. And so anyway, I just wanted to take this moment and just say, you know, this, we're, we're trying to help you get your loan submission in, um, but things could change and it might not be exactly the way we interpreted it, but hopefully you can rely on us to get a pretty good, what we think the intent was without actually having the final, final, final interpretation of the law. And um, ultimately the bankers are the ones that are gonna have to decide if they fit the parameters there. So just wanted to throw that out there as I guess as a qualification. Um, so once you get your loan, the, you can defer your payments for that loan from anywhere between six months and up to a year. And then this is the biggie right here is that there's a loan forgiveness component where uh, you can get some of the loan or all of it forgiven, including the interest that has accrued on the loan. Uh, to do that, you need to make sure that the use of the loan proceeds are primarily for payroll. Um, you can also use it for mortgage interest payments, rent, utilities, and interest on pre-existing debt. There's also a, uh, if you have an existing EIDL loan, which we'll get into, you can refinance that into a PPP, which would be advantageous. And then a few other uses that we're not going to go into at the moment. Um, companies are, like I said, are eligible for loan forgiveness as they, they are applied towards the covered costs. The covered costs, they'll have a period in which they are incurred that that's what they use that period of time to measure the forgiven how much of it would be forgiven the loan so and that is that period at which they begin the measurements is from the loan origination date for eight weeks thereafter and so you go get your loan from the bank or another uh, lending institution from the moment you get that that's when the clock starts ticking and we start measuring your payroll costs and these other uh, covered costs that would go into the loan forgiveness calculation. Um, also bear in mind that the loan forgiveness is can be reduced if you don't maintain current, uh, well, former prior of retention levels, assuming that your retention levels have gone down for employees and or it, maintaining their em previous employee salaries. So, um, so with that in mind, just keep this thought that you have a 75%, 25% rule where 75% of your PPP loan needs to be applied towards payroll costs in order for it to be fully forgiven. 75% there, at least 75%, and then the additional 25% can be made with those other covered costs that we've identified. Um, so now this is where some strategy might come into play. Uh, you need to have those the restoration of your employees by June 30th, 2020. So the reason I say strategy might come into play here would be, let's say you get the loan in a week or two weeks, um, but you're on unemployment. You know what you want to just make sure is that you cover the amount of your um, those payroll costs of the forgiven, but we can get into that a little bit more about strategy and how to deal with that and making sure you have enough payments that were made that would cover those loans. Um, so we can talk about that in a little bit. 
Um, so what do you have to provide for the banks? The banks are varying, and like I said, they we got the final regs on Thursday last week, and the banks were supposed to be ready by Friday. Needless to say, a lot of them are not ready for, and were not ready for this. In fact, some links have pulled out and just said we can't we can't do this. And so there's other there's banks and lending institutions that are available. And we have a list of a few of those um, that you'll be able to get these loans through. Um, then what happens on this loan forgiveness then what we were talking about is after you get the loan um, and then you go through your eight weeks you recircle back with the lender and they're the ones that are getting to determine uh, whether or not your covered costs are enough to and how much is going to be applied to the loan forgiveness now before we get too many questions on that area the sba the u.s treasury said that they will issue regulations uh, uh, in the future. So we don't know the, the really uh, the specific the specifics on how is that to be calculated. We just know that the employee retention and previous salaries are going to come into play and then those costs during that eight week period. So uh, just be patient. As soon as those come out, we, you'll get that information on our website or through additional webinars like this. Or you can contact our COVID response team and just put a, a message. And again, um, Sarah said that she had set a link so you can just contact them and we'll get back to you pretty quickly. The other thing that, which is great is that the loans are 100% guaranteed by the SBA, SBA and their non-recourse. Okay, so applications are available now for small businesses and sole proprietorships. And supposedly the applications for independent contractors and self-employed persons are going to be available on April 10th. Again, this is a, just been a whirlwind uh, for everybody involved and we expect um, regulations, but there could be some timing issues as far as when these applications will be ready, who will be able to accept them and all that. So again, just if you can just use us as your resource, to keep you up to speed on that, um, we will do our best to get right back to you and let you know what's going on there. Now, I mentioned that you can apply for these loans usually with your bank or credit union, some SBA approved lender, um, like FinTech companies are also in there. Now, we've also um, had some experience with a couple of FinTech companies like Lendio and Divi uh, who've been all over this. And so if you're not getting uh, the response that you want from your bank, you may consider one of these other fintech companies such as Lindial or Divi. Um, uh, but uh, some of our clients have actually done that and gone out there. So we just recommend that you look at your options and evaluate those. Um, but the application for this PPP is pretty small, pretty short, and uh, hopefully they'll get you in just as soon as you can get there. Um, so there's some certifications that you must um, basically attest to when you're applying for this loan is basically you got to say that you know that the uh, this pandemic basically has had a negative effect on your business and has in, you know in, injured your business so you'll need to attest to that you need to say that the funds will be used to retain employees or cover employee costs um, or those other approved costs, and that you do not have an emergency, an EIDL loan uh, that doubles up on those same costs. So there is some confusion out there whether or not you can apply for a payment protection program loan and also an EIDL loan. And just be assured that you can apply for both provided that you're not getting the loans on the same costs. So just just keep that in mind and we'll talk a little bit about more about that with the economic injury uh, and disaster loans in a second. Um, let's talk about the um, average monthly payroll costs. So how do you how do you calculate the average monthly payroll? First of all, it's it's gross payroll and it's capped at one hundred thousand dollars per employee. So if a person and it's for the year ending 2019, generally speaking, there is a provision for um, seasonal businesses. But for the most part, for purposes of this discussion, let's just talk about how to do it for a business that's been in place 
last year in, in 2019, they'd take their gross payroll. And for now, let's just assume that everybody was paid less than $100,000. You add that gross payroll, you add to it be additional benefits paid that weren't included in that payroll, such as insurance benefits. To me, this is the other part of this is where it says per vacation, parental, family, medical, all that kind of stuff. In addition to that, if that's separate. So that's where it gets a little confusing in this interpretation. But as I've read through numerous documents and also the SBA uh, slides um, and additional readings out there on the internet, I believe that if you just go with your gross payroll and then add to it your insurance benefits, and then you take in any retirement costs such as the 401k match for the employer and any state taxes paid in association with the payroll taxes. So that's gonna be, you know, like suited taxes and those types of taxes. You add those four items together and then you divide that by 12 and times it by two and a half. So yesterday I helped a client, a uh, small business has about eight to 10 employees he runs his stuff on QuickBooks. We, I had him just print out a, the pay, summary payroll report for the year. We went to his gross payroll line, took that number, added in uh, the, his insurance benefits paid, and and added in some uh, those the state taxes associated with employment taxes, and plus his uh, retirement, the employer portion of the retirement. T took those numbers, divided by 12 times by two and a half. And that was the amount that he put in and submitted. It was a pretty quick and simple process. Um, so I think the key here right now is because the funds are limited, is that you do need to get, you know, I would uh, put some urgency, but be calm um, to this calculation. And um, the key would be that we just want to make sure that you have money for your small business to keep that thing afloat, right? To keep it going and to do what you can to keep it going. And, and when this recovery comes around, which it will, I am full confidence that we'll be able to get through this, um, that you'll be set to uh, take on and move forward uh, with your business. Um, again, we, we'll go get into some of those details and the questions that you have in just a minute. Okay, let's talk about the economic injury and disaster loan. Um, this one is a loan that is available. Again, it's, you have to have 500 or fewer employees. Um, and oh, one thing I do need to mention, I've got to backtrack one second. Your, cut, your payroll costs need to make sure that you include payroll only for those people that have a residence in the, in the United States. So just as a side note there, you'll need to do that. Um, so the economic injury disaster loan. Uh, these, this is for businesses with 500 or fewer employees. Um, and then you have to be looking at a disaster area. Utah is considered a disaster area and so suffered so similar to the PPP, you need to have suffered uh, injury because of the disaster. Now, this is a nuance that, well, not even a nuance, it's a requirement is, is can your business have gotten or received uh, credit elsewhere and that's and th that's a big question and some business may maybe before COVID-19 they could have gotten um, some additional credit or lending but maybe because of the disaster they don't get that right now and so um, so maybe because of that you would be able to um, you'd be eligible for the EIDL loan. This has um, a loan amount of up to two million dollars the interest rate is 3.75% and two point for small businesses, for-profit businesses, and and 2.75% for nonprofits. So 3.75 for small businesses. I'm not sure if I messed that up, but anyway, um, and you can get uh, payments up to 30 years. And again, but this this one is going to be a little bit longer and coming um, because it's going through the SBA and they're going to go through these requirements, a little stricter requirements and and they can turn you down so they do look at your credit and the company and your ability to repay the use of these proceeds are supposed to be used for fixed debts payroll accounts payable and other bills that can't be paid because of the disastrous impact um, 
that may not be used to refinance long-term debt. The loans are not intended to replace lost sales or profits or for expansion. So, you know, this is this uh, bullet point is directly from the SBA slideshow, and it, it brings up some issues with regard to the ethical, re moral, um, you know, situation of each of us. You know, because each of us has, you know, we could look at this and decide, oh, I'm going to push the envelope here or there. But right now, uh, you know, the best thing that we can do for everybody concerned is to follow the rules and stay within the parameters and the intent that the SBA, these loans are for, and our economy will recover a lot faster than it would otherwise. So I would encourage everybody to, to, to you know, take an inside look, make sure you're doing the right thing here and doing what's best for everybody concerned here. So. Just sorry, get a little bit of Dwayne AC philosophy in there. Okay, so again, I mentioned the, the loan, some of the loan requirements. You can't get credit elsewhere, acceptable credit history, ability to repay the loan. Um, so it must be secured with collateral. There's a few other requirements, um, but and but you don't have to take the loan. I think that's pretty critical right here. Now associated with this loan. And again, we can get into the strategy there a little bit, but associated with this loan is the $10,000 is a $10,000 grant um, that if you apply for it and you don't get it, you should, as long as funds permit, that's what I've heard. I haven't been able to verify that yet, uh, but you should be able to get it, meaning, you sh meaning how who all gets it. I heard it, it's, it was, Kind of a first come first serve basis, and there was a cap of how many, how much there is available under the ten thousand dollar grant. But I have not read that anywhere. So, um, but it stands to reason because there is a cap on the PPP and the and the EIDL uh, both. But we'll talk about that too. Um, the immediate relief is designed to offer bridge protection, and and then the grant you have no obligation to repay. If you do get a grant, though and you get the PPP, uh, the grant comes into play, it will actually reduce your recovered costs, your covered costs when you're going to, you know, have that, the loan amount um, repaid that calculation. So if, if for instance, you had a $200,000 loan and you got a, um, the $10,000 grant and you didn't get an EIDL loan, uh, and but your cost were $200,000 plus during that eight week period, you would have to pay back $190,000 because you get the $200,000. But again, the, the EIDL comes into it would reduce that that cost amount. So that's my understanding on that is it would come into play and you would have a little bit of a loan there. So. Um, OK, so with that, I went fairly quickly. But now we'll move to question, questions and answers and maybe some strategies. So um, let me let me read through some of these questions and we'll start answering them and hopefully uh, hopefully we'll be able to help you with those. OK, it says questions um, on on March 20th, we terminated some workers that were hired through a temp agency due to anticipated slowdown. What impact did this, does this have related to the CARES Act? So again, um, what happens is hopefully if you get the PPP, uh, if you're applying for that or the EIDL, you just have to use those proceeds on payroll. So if you've uh, reduced your workforce, um, you'd want to hopefully rehire those people back. Again, you just need to look at your cash flow and stuff, but you'd hire those people back and start employing them and hopefully you get qualified for the loan forgiveness and that. Um, the thing to consider here in my mind is you know will your business be up and running one of my clients is a dentist he, um, and he's been ordered by the governor not to practice so when will his business be up and going he can only do emergency procedures right now and so we estimated you know that he's probably not going to be up and going until may or june at the earliest and so so the question is what do you do with his employees and so we're, we, we talked about, you know, when do we let them, what, when should he let them go? Uh, encourage them to go get workers comp. 
unemployment compensation, excuse me, we're not working comp, un unemployment compensation. And then at what point do you hire them back? And at what point do you time this with regards to the, the covered period, you know, provided that he gets that in a timely fashion, you know, he applied, we applied for that loan yesterday for him. Okay, so hopefully that answers that question. Interested in better understanding the SBA loan qualification application hurdles? I think we went through that, but if you have more questions, let me know. Can a sole proprietor who does not have a history of paying payroll, but rather draws, uh, still qualify for aid? Yes, the answer is yes. And how do we apply for the loan? Do we need to spend down all of our company's cash before we get the loan? So uh, for sole proprietors, there is an application, same application um, for independent contractors and self-employed. I don't know why they distinguish it because sole proprietors in my mind kind of fit that same area. But again, this is some of those verbiage problems. But um, sole proprietors, you can apply now through the financial institution for self-employed and independent contractors, which to me, that's kind of the same thing. Again, those applications should be ready on, uh, on the 10th. We're hoping that they are. We'll just have to wait and see if they are. Um, do you need to spend down the company's cash before you get the, absolutely not. Are, are there exceptions to the 500 employee rule? I've read through those, um, you know, the docs out there. There are a few limited, very narrow exceptions other than the being in the food and accommodation services industry. However, Bear in mind that there are other credits eligible for people uh, for the greater than 500, you know, not even greater, it could be less than or greater, but for people that don't participate in the Paycheck Protection Program, they can qualify for the um, for business or payroll credits up to uh, $5,000 of per per employee for the year for this year for 2020. So we, we are going to have some additional information on those credits, um, but because the pressure is on right now to, get, to apply for these PPP and the EIDL loans, we're focusing on those. However, if you want to call us or you have a question about the other things, we're going to have a future webinar and additional newsletters that will be coming out, out on those other credits that are available. Um, if we pay contractors, let's see, questions during the web. If we pay, okay, so uh, is, if we pay contractors, is that part of the forgiveness for the PPP loan? No, not my understanding is that this is just those same covered costs. So you have to use the covered, the, the cost that you took the monthly, two point monthly, you calculated your average monthly payroll. Those are the same costs that they want to go into the calculation on the forgiveness, up to 75% of those costs. So 25% can be for the others, but we're talking about just bear in mind that this is dealing with employees. And so that would that would be not applicable based on my understanding. Okay. Is loan forgivable if our sales streams remain about the same? So sales are not part of the forgiveness calculation. You'll not be penalized for maintaining sales. Yes, that is correct. Um, that was the answer. Megan put that in there, made it easy for me. So thanks, Megan. Um, can you have multiple loans and process multiple lenders? Uh, I realized that it would be wrong to actually get multiple loans, but curious trying to avoid bottleneck issues with certain lenders if you would imagine. No, once you've applied with one lender, you cannot apply elsewhere. And that's again, uh, and, I, and thank you, you, you know, you said you're not trying to do anything wrong there. I can understand you're trying to, um, you know, facilitate getting your loan, getting the monies, maintaining your company and keeping your company afloat and going. Um, so that's why we say evaluate up front your, your, each of your lenders. And if they are, are having trouble, for instance, if you're with Wells Fargo, I read yesterday that Wells Fargo had stopped, um, stopped taking applications because they'd reached their le lending limit. I don't know what today, I haven't been on to see exactly what happened today, but if that's the situation, you want to probably skirt that issue and go to someone else. Or if a bank is not ready and there are plenty of banks that are not ready and aren't, they might be taking applications, but they're not submitting them because they're not ready. So make sure you ask your banking representative, are you actually submitting or are you, you know, at what point are you, you know, at what stage is the company in, in actually submitting 
the applications to the SBA. Now, just keep in mind also, though, uh, on Friday and Saturday, $30 billion had been applied and the, the SBA had processed $5 billion on Saturday by, by Saturday. So um, just, you know, this, this is moving and it's moving forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about, you know, not to be too overly excited about not getting it on in my opinion, but this again, my opinion. Um, but right now, I think you're on the front end of this and hopefully if you get that in, you'll be able to get your loan. Okay, do you need to deduct from gross pay or the non-tax items so that the number ties to the 941s? There are some banks that are interpreting this differently. We believe the intention is gross wages. So if, if you have your, it, Years, let's see. So, if you have health insurance without reduced your 940, so gross wages would not tie to 940, and that's what would be correct. So, so on this item, this there is confusion in this. Again, our my interpretation of this is go with gross wages, don't back out anything for federal withholding, FICA, and Medicare. Go with the gross wage calculation. Your bank might have, have a differing view, and this is the problem that's out there. But based on, again, whatever everything I've read, I believe this is the correct calculation. Take your gross, add into your benefits in addition to wages actually paid, and that plus some probably minuscule amounts with regard to state unemployment or state payroll taxes and uh, your, your retirement benefits, those types of things. Add those all in, divide that by 12 times by two and a half, and you should get there. Um, let's see. Can I repay on rent during the eight week period and have that included in the forbi forgivable portion? Uh, yes, um, just as we mentioned before, you can't, that amount can't exceed 25% of your total covered costs. So you will get a reduction if your rent is reduced relative, you know, if, it, if your rent payment is actually more than your payroll payment, you know, so you know, more than 75%. So if it's disproportionate, even if your payroll was 60% and your rent was, you know, 40%, then you'd have a reduction in the amount of your forgiveness because you can only get up to 70, 75% needs to be from your payroll. So, so that's where strategy comes into play. You want to make sure that that payroll cost is covering it. But again, the loan was based on two and a half months of payroll. So if you hire back those people, hopefully you'll be able to cover those costs and get it forgiven. Um, what's the date that they're looking at for employee headcount? Is it headcount as of a certain date or actual employees as of a certain date? Yes and yes. Uh, June 30 is my understanding is what they want you to have that uh, employee headcount up and also what you're paying them by that point in time. But it, as such, bear in mind that you also not only June 30, you know, you want to make sure that your cost up to that point are enough to cover so you get the forgiveness. And maybe, you know, maybe the forgiveness is not, the, that's a high priority. But on the other hand, maybe you're just trying to survive. So again, strategy wise, maybe it's like, yeah, we could have these people be on unemployment, but our business, we're going to have a delay. And when it's actually get going, we could still take the loan maybe get some of these covered costs, but we ultimately, you know, maybe we should just make sure we have that loan in place. And so what we do is we let them be on unemployment for a period of time. And, and then we, we, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here, maybe we can, um, we can employ them by that June 30 date and use some of those costs to offset it, but otherwise we have this loan in place. And so maybe by doing that, you've extended your, the, the lifeblood of your company for a while because you now have this loan, even though it might not be forgiven at the moment, but because you want you didn't have to incur those costs and then have them sitting around because your business wasn't going versus delaying it all a little bit. So in my mind, there's some strategy that you kind of need to employ here to see what's best for your firm and what your expectations are. It's not just, uh, oh, here, here it is, let's do it. Let's employ everybody with put two and a half months of payroll on the books and then we're sitting around for two another month or so without doing anything and theoretically now you're back to the same position you were in when you you know you left so it's money in money back out and you're still not able to work as your business hopefully that won't be the case though hopefully we'll be through this uh you know the peak crisis and 
and we'll be on our way to getting a vaccine and that stuff. So let's see. Can I repay? Okay, during what's the date that they're looking for at at for employee account? Okay, we talked about it. What incentive do banks have to make these loans? Okay, so good question. Uh, the banks are gonna get a percent of the loan up to 350,000, I think it's 5% from, or 350,000 up to, I think it's like 2 million. I uh, had those amounts, but they get a lesser amount. And then after that, it's um, 3%, I think. Um, so let me see if I have that right now. Um, maybe I can have Megan chime in on that if she can look that up, if she has a second, maybe she does, I don't know. Uh, well, she's busy giving questions, but yeah, so what happens is the bank is getting a fee that's going to be paid by the government to make these loans. Plus, they're supposed to be um, getting the interest, you know, unless it gets forgiven, but the interest covered by the government. So um, as far as, you know, if it's forgiven. So um, so hopefully that's what, you know, what's happening is, well, that is what's happening is they're getting this fee for making the loans. Okay. Sorry, I lost my spot here. Okay, yeah, are interest rates adequate to incentivize them? Well, again, that's the fee. I think that's the part that's the big part. Um, I answered, do they receive compensation from the government for funding these loans? Yes. Are they motivated financially such that they will be on top of the entire process? process? Some banks, yes. Some banks, no. Some banks, like I said, are just saying this is this is uh, too much of a hassle for us. Excuse me, um, to you know pursue this, and they just don't. They're actually not even uh, trying to be part of this process. I've heard that current SBA loan holders are higher priority for the PPP borrower application, meaning SBA is trying to accommodate current loan holders with priority. I uh, don't know the answer to your question there. What about a new business that started in January? How would you recommend we do the two and a half calculation, payroll calculation? Um, yeah, that's I, what I would recommend on that one is you reach out to one of our, uh, um, reach out and we'll, we'll reach back out to you because you'll be in the minority here. And so if we can talk to you um, on that particular issue, that'd be great. Um, if you just want to reach, just say you, you, you know, if you sign up to have us uh, get back to you, we'll get back to you within 24 hours. Uh, what if we have an investor family as a 12% shareholder, would this disqualify us as eligible as we have an institution as a shareholder? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking for this uh, on this particular issue. Let's see. What if we have an investor family office as a 12% shareholder? Would this disqualify eligible as we have an institution as a shareholder? Hmm. I don't know what. There are some affiliation rules that we can discuss if we need to. Uh, but um, if if you're a small business. It, and it just depends on which one you're talking about. If it's the Paycheck Protection Program, if you're less than 500, the criteria is pretty, pretty. There's only a few items that you have to meet it, and so uh, meet the criteria. If you fall into that criteria, then you can qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program. For the EIDL loan, um, you're gonna. They'll look at your individual potentially if you're they're looking kind of with individuals that have 20 percent or more in the company. They're kind of looking at their net worth and their abilities to repay and that type of thing. So um, again, I'm not quite sure what you're asking on this one. If you want to put a clarifying question, maybe we can address it. <coughs> uh, if we pay contractors as part of the forgiveness, I think we answer that. That would be no. It's the employees. Um, in a small business LLC, one owner, can you include the owner's income who is not considered an employee in the payroll cost figure? Uh, that one, small business LLC is disregarded for um, tax purposes. Um, again, this, this is where there is some confusion. I think this is where you, you'd be self-employed and those rules are going to come out on how to calculate that this week. We expect them to come out this week. So I would say stay tuned. Um, 
does a does a, a one personnel okay apply no employees just income that's the same question uh yes if you're self-employed again we should be able to get some information this week and hopefully application will be available or at least the calculations will be available and we'll be able to help you through that but we don't have that those guidelines yet on how to do that but yes it does you do do qualify how should sole proprietors be calculating document payroll costs for owners who don't take a traditional salary from the business sole proprietors be calculating document payroll costs for owners who don't take a traditional salary good question and uh, this is where I get confused as well as I would say that should be more handled by the the guidelines of the of the self-employed and independent contractors um, and so that's that's my personal feeling on that I think if we'll get those guidelines we'll be able to help you out more on that but uh, the sole proprietorship they say that's available and I did see the application um, and so I think it's, it would be in my personal opinion is what it's going to boil down to is your earnings you know your earnings net in or earnings that are subject to self-employment tax i think that's the number that you're going to be looking for in this calculation um i'm an orthodontist and don't know when we will be able to resume seeing patients i assume i should not take the ppp until we are seeing patients and all my employees are back good again this is uh, i've been dealing with a couple uh, dentists and an orthodontist and i would um uh, this is a good to get into the strategy, uh, but along these lines, I would say apply for the Paycheck Protection Program loan currently, um, and then hopefully you get it. let's see how long that that's going to apply. But the reason I'm saying that is because these funds currently will run out. But and I say a but. I believe that additional legislation will be passed to um shore up the shortfall that there will be regarding this uh, stimulus package um, the aicpa is which is the american institute of certified public accountants of which cpas generally most cpas are members of they are petitioning uh congress right now trying to say hey this is a big deal and you know there, there's going to be a need uh, and there likely there's other, well there are other movements of you know right now afoot that um, I think there'll be additional stimulus packages that will be available um, to cover the shortfall. But, but because I don't know for sure, our advice right now would be to apply for that, get in line as quickly as you can, find the best lender that you can, and and maybe the best lender is the best, the one that can process your your information the fastest. So find out before you apply what, what the status is of your business applications. Now that is also going to be somewhat complicated because um, Wells, for instance, like I said, Wells Fargo met their, met their lending limit. They may come in and raise that form, you know, based on all this. But so if other people, if everybody goes out to someone that can process loans, and those guys meet their lending limits then the people that have the banks that don't have their stuff in place right now but they might have it they still have lending limits so i that's it's really hard but i my personal opinion is i would apply as soon as possible to get get that money and hopefully you're going to be in a situation where you can utilize that but worst case scenario is you have a pretty low interest rate loan um, that you're dealing with so again, yeah, I don't know. My initial response was, oh, let's, uh, if the monies are gonna be available, let's let people be on un un unemployment for a period of time until we know we can, you know, we can actually get going again. And then let's execute on the, the PPP, you know, so let's, let's not execute on the PPP, the loan origination date for another month. Hopefully this thing's passed and they allow us to work. Then we execute on, then we have eight weeks, right? But then there's other things to consider is in the meantime, have your employees, have they gone somewhere else, right? Um, you know, there's all sorts of factors. If you want to reach out to us, me or Megan or someone else, we can walk through some strategies on that. I walked on Saturday, I was 
talking to a person, not a client, just helping them out. Um, and we walked through a strategy on how to make sure that she she covered the cost of her PPP loan and and the timing of it and what we were, you know, what we had to do to make sure she met the headcount issue and those types of things. And we came up with a good plan for her. And I think she was excited at the end of the day. It's things that she hadn't considered before. So um, but thanks for that question. If our seasonal business is about to uh, the higher as he is about to hire a lot of people in May, should we wait to start the loan for then for the eight week period? Again, that goes kind of back to what I just previously said. My recommendation would be to get the loan uh, going uh, because we don't know when the funds will run out. Now, if if you do get the loans, you're going to have to make that decision right now. I would say go for it, get the loan. If you think there's going to be additional legislation passed, there may or may not. Maybe you just wait. Uh, but I I really don't know how to advise you at that on that particular issue. Could applying for the 10,000 grant potentially slow down the PPE application in place in line? No, uh, they're t they're totally different, going through different um, methods. One's going through the SBA, the other one's going through banks and other lending financial institutions and fintech companies. So they're just totally separate. Um, can the FMLA for people with children out of school and the sick leave for those with mandatory sick leave be paid included in the uh, sick leave be included with the PPL forgiveness? My understanding is yes. Uh, can you clarify the exemption for rehires clause on loan forgiveness? If we rehire to 100% on June 30th, will we receive 100 forgiveness for payroll during the cover period? So again, the regs aren't out on how to do the calculation, but if you hire everybody on June 30th, are you going to pay everybody on June 30th? Is that is that June 30th included in your eight week period? So again, the PPP starts, let's say you get that loan. Uh, today's the uh, April 7th. Let's say you get that loan next week, April 15th, April 15th, eight weeks start right so june 15th june 15th between april 15th and june 15th that's two months worth of pay that you should have incurred right two two months worth if you wait till june 30th and don't incur those payroll costs on june 30th by june 30th those are the costs that you're going to use to get your loan Primarily, 75% of those costs, the, the loan forgiveness has to be based on employee payroll costs during the covered period, during those eight weeks. So that's why the timing of the loan and when you rehire employees back is pretty critical if you want the forgiveness. And so, again, that's where some strategy might come into play, but the the whole purpose of the this program is to get people back and and employ back in the companies and employed by the companies and being paid right so that's the whole purpose of it and so remember that if you hire on june 30th now probably it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to get much loan forgiveness because the majority of your costs would be after that period that eight week period if you got the loan on april 15th the closer that loan origination date is to june 30th then then your chances of more loan forgiveness go up at that point. Okay, um, can you clear this? Okay, what if an employee who has laid off does not want to be rehired because they have found other employment? Does that mean the PPP would become a loan instead? Of yes, unless you hire someone else at the same rate. So, uh, yeah, if 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 your employee goes somewhere else, now you got to either hire someone else or you're going to end up paying a loan, you know, paying for that person or excuse me, paying for the loan that covered his cost, you know, was part of that original loan calculation that you no longer have. So you you got to keep your employee headcount out and it's best based on full time equivalents. So if you had five full time equivalents before, you know, on uh, the 15th of February, I think it was. We'll have to see you, but based on full time equivalents, let's say you had four full time equivalents, and then by June 30th, you had three. Well, potentially, and again, we don't have the regs, but potentially one quarter 
you lose one quarter of the recovery of your total cover costs because your retention your employer retention is down so um so yeah that's key so you could hire someone else um but you need to make sure that your full-time equivalents are at or above the same the level that you had prior to this uh that's all this going on What if an employee who was laid off does not want to be hired because they have found other? Okay, can you apply for the PPP and then not take the loan until employees are back, or does it fund immediately? I think it funds them. You know, as soon as it gets through the funding process, it funds. Um, so uh, that's my understanding. But again, that's a good strategic question, and we've kind of talked about it quite a bit here. Does our business need to be suffering in order to qualify for loan forgiveness if our sales remain the same? Yes, as part of this whole process, if you're not haven't been injured by this by the coronavirus, you shouldn't be applying for the loan. That would be an you know an ethical situation where people should not apply for this loan if their business has not been harmed by it. I have a client. It was very refreshing because the client said, the CEO said, "Hey, we have we we have enough money in the bank and." And we can write this out and I don't feel comfortable signing those attestation, you know, the attestation, basically this the statements that you're representing. Um, so he would he just said, no, we're not going to do that. And um, and so I was very impressed and very, very excited that he took that stance. Um, so um, yeah, so you need to be suffering because to, in order to apply, that's one of the premises for these loans. We are seasonal business. We were just swinging up when COVID-19 started. Income business has died considerably and I'm on the verge of letting employees go. By obtaining this PPP loan, do I keep the employees around to do minimal things at work or do I send them back home to collect unemployment and pay them PPP? How does this work? That's a great question. And again, we kind of addressed it, but let me talk to you about another client who is in the food industry, right? And he said, I. The purpose of the loan is to keep employees employed. He he's he's been he's not let his people go. He's hopefully gonna get this loan and he's gonna he said, I'm gonna have them clean every nook and cranny in my store, right? Everything's gotta be clean and we're just we're gonna put them to work. I'm gonna keep them working. Now, I watched a video uh yesterday from the AICPA president. Again, that's the American Institute of Public Certified Public Accountants where he he agreed that the purpose was to keep employees employed to pay them and not take the unemployment to use these loans to do that and his point was take this opportunity businesses own business owners and people should take this opportunity to look for ways that they can add value to their company maybe it's put a task force and say okay we can is there anything better that we can streamline in our company you know, you're you're now put your brains to use on something else that traditionally it's not been applied for, and so hopefully maybe you come up with a whole new process for your for your company. Uh, I think this can actually bring about some huge changes uh, for your companies that would benefit you going forward if we just try to think that through and take advantage of this this unique opportunity that we have even though you know it's a bummer and all that happened but let's look on the bright side and look at the opportunities that are available to us uh, i think it, it could go a long way now one other thing i want to throw out there as i've observed this uh this is just again Dwayne ac philosophy and not necessarily squire's philosophy but i think this this whole pandemic will change the dynamics of the business world from the standpoint that companies will realize that people can work from home in a lot of situations. Now there's other there's certain companies that won't be able to, but there are plenty of companies that can, their employees and staffing, excuse me, can and can work from home and want to work from home. Which, if you think about it, if they can, why do I need to pay if I'm a business owner? Why do I need to pay for additional um, office space? Right? Office space is a huge expense. So if I can hire people, have them work from home, I've just saved my my company a, a, a bundle of money, right? Uh, you know, so it's just something that you might want to consider. In fact, I have a couple clients that said they he went to the office, typically over 100 employees in there, 
And uh, he said, there's only six or seven people in the office right now. And he goes, you know, the interesting thing is, Dwayne, I said, what? And he goes, our, pro our productivity is actually going up. Um, and so I was like, really? And then, he's, and then he also said, and guess what? My, one, of my one of my kids who just graduated from college, he said he, he was told no because of the, the pandemic. They didn't want to bring him in and stuff. But later, the company, like a week later, called him back and said, hey, you can just work from home. We'll hire you anyway. And, and so they're just planning to use him. Don't, they don't have to make another space in their office. They don't have to add office space. They don't buy a desk. They're just have to provide them some equipment and do what I'm doing so that everybody else can see, you know, Dwayne's Wild America behind them. But anyway, some thoughts just to consider. Um, can we talk through the agent fee? Uh, sure. The agent fee, as far as I know, um, some banks are not, uh, and this wasn't well written, but Originally, we thought we would possibly be able to participate as part of the agent fee because we helping you know people do this. But as we as we found out that some banks just don't want to share, and so and I don't think that was the intent of Congress and the laws and stuff. And so they're just the agent fee is is supposed to be paid if, but there's applications that don't have um, have that they're not even taking names on that so i don't know that agent fee is is a question mark in my mind um there are some banks that are saying did you you know do you have an agent and so on so some banks are saying did you work with some someone on this what the way that would work is the fee that would be paid to the banks would be shared with whoever the agent is okay so we thanks uh for putting this in here that was perfect megan so the, someone asked about what the fee was. So, and this this is the, what it was. It was 5% uh, on up to 350,000, 3% from uh, there on up to 2 million, and 1% on loans at 2 million, up to 2 million. So, for the, so let's see, 450 to 2 million was 3%. Lender fees, 1% of loans, at least 2 million. Three, three lo oh, so 2 million up to 10 because it's under the PPP. Yeah, so two million to ten, it's one percent. Uh, four fifty, three percent on loans from three fifty to uh, two million, and five five percent on more than three fifty, on up to five uh, three fifty. So, so hopefully that was that clarifies that. What if I lease my employees from another company that actually pays the taxes, such as ADP? Great question. So we believe that this. Uh, if you have leased employees, meaning if if they're common law, what we call common law, common law employees of your company, then you should be able to use those in your PPP calculation is our belief. For example, we have a leasing companies that we work with that they have their administrative staff, but then they have these these employees that their employees because companies want them to be employees because they can use the group benefits right and they can get a better group benefit that's why they use these leasing companies really those employees are employees of the company not necessarily the leasing company so we call that common law employees so so the administrative side of the leasing company the people that are there that are processing and all that stuff which is you know usually that's a small number of employees that are running that particular company that'd be their common law employees but the actual leased employees, those would be the common law employees of the company that contracted with the leasing company. So that's our belief is that's those are the numbers that you should be lead, you should be using would be your quote unquote common law employees, right? So hopefully that that explains that. I have not seen any specific regulations on that, but I believe that's what you should be doing. Um, do you have to pay each employee's one or each employee's one hundred percent of what we, you were paying them? Do you have to pay, or can you reduce the payment? I think I read you can pay some of foreign parents to have the PP loan. Now, my understanding is you you want to get it up to you get a you want to get it up to what they were paid previously. There could be a potential reduction if you don't have them up to the level that they were paid out previously. 
uh, again, those guidelines have not come out, but that's my understanding. And and I I would be, I can't tell you for sure. I, I would guess that that might all change. And so I would say, uh, just, just don't worry about the forgiveness. Let's get the loan first in place. So um, let's see, Megan's helping me out here. So. Let's see, the reduction applies for 75%. So her point, I think what Megan is trying to say is that you still, your payroll costs, your total payroll costs can be, um, you know, less than what you had before and it'll still go towards loan forgiveness. And, um, but you might have a limitation on those costs, right? D due to retention, the number of full-time equivalents you have and potentially, potentially, the uh, if you've reduced people's payroll. Again, I don't know. That's going to be kind of hard to monitor. I don't know if that's what's going to be in the actual regs. That's just what my, my understanding was. Okay. Can you apply for both the payroll protection loan as well as the self-employed loan because we have seasonal employees and our own wage, but the information we submit for the loan because they want 2019 and divide that by 12 does not even amount to as much as we would need for eight weeks of payroll for all employees and we would pay us nothing. Let's see. So seasonal, there is a seasonal, uh, separate seasonal calculation that you you can use. Um, the, the problem with, uh, so as I thought this out, um, that seasonal employee, I think it's February 15th through, uh, it's a 12 week period through like, um, May 31st, I think. Um, <clears throat> but the the issue, as I thought this through, as actually when I was out running this morning, early this morning, I was thinking this actually through. Why didn't they choose a different um, seasonal time frame to do the measurement period? And the reason that I thought about was the reason they didn't do that is they're just trying to get everybody over this hump of time where for seasonal employees, hopefully it doesn't apply. Right. What, so if, you, if you're uh, trying to understand what I'm saying here is uh, they're just saying if you're a seasonal employer that you're going to probably be in business back in, you know, April, maybe the end of April, maybe May, maybe June, you know, and, and so it's not going to affect your business that much. I think that's what their intent was. Um, I am not sure. Unfortunately, this does affect people if this thing persists and your seasonal employees are going to be affected by this, you know, because they can't get out. I don't think that the the rules uh, help you out in that situation at this point in time. That could change as the length of this, uh, you know, the stay at home rule uh, persist, then maybe in future uh, stimulus acts, they might change something or they might change the, you know, how to calculate it if you're in that situation. So that, that one's a hard one. I understand what you're saying. I just don't know how to address it other than, yeah, you, 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 you use the PPP or the modified PPP, which is the, you know, the, the seasonal calculation, which is based on a, a February 15, 12 week, 10 or 12 weeks, depending which is better for you calculation. So if you wanna get into that calculation, again, contact the member of our team we have we have those dates for you and we'll go from there. It's okay. Thanks, Megan. It's from February 15th through June 30th if you're seasonal. So you can use that one, those dates, divide it by 10 or 12, whatever weeks those are, however many weeks that is. And, and hopefully that will give you a better calculation that it would for the entire year. So, um, so that, that again, talk to one, a person on our team and they can walk you through that if you need additional information, but we do have, uh, it, it is something that might be applicable for you that would help you. Um, when we filed out that application, it asked us numbers of employees. It didn't ask our average number of employees. Can you explain how number of employees be considered over the eight week period of time? Also rehiring, does it have to, to be the same em employees? Uh, my I don't believe it has to be the same employees. Um, again, when the reading that I did, it's back to full-time equivalents. So that would take your part-time and, and full-time people, add them all together. If you have two part-time, that's one full-time equivalent. So it's gonna be, my understanding is it's gonna be based on full-time equivalents. So <clears throat> it doesn't have to be the same employees, just because 
no one can control if someone's going to leave you, but the question would be, can you bring in someone else and therefore qualify to make sure you get the recovery? So hopefully that answers your question there. Um, again, be patient on those. We're going to get those guidelines and they'll be coming out, but they're just scrambling, trying to, uh, trying to do what they can on their end. They didn't understand all the repercussions of this bill. And so to me, they, you know, we can all be critical uh, and say, yeah, they should have waited and stuff. They're trying to, they were trying to help and get this thing through. Unfortunately, you know, people get in their little, they have to have their own pieces of the pie basically and stick that in there, which complicates things. But at the end of the day, this intent was to help small businesses and, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to get some additional information. Hopefully those people that don't get the PPP would, you know, something else will come and we'll be able to get the economy going back the way it's supposed to be. Um, so let's see if we, so anyway, be, just be patient. We'll get that some information on the actual recovery, but I would focus on your business, focus on the loan, the PPP, focus on those things right now. We're, uh, let's worry about the, recovery of costs and the loan forgiveness later. Um, <coughs> that, that'd be my suggestion right now. Again, we will have that information as soon as it comes out. <clears throat> if we have employees that make more than 100K, is there a penalty to decrease their salaries to 100K? No, well, it's, no, because you're, so if let's say someone was paid $120,000. So if you take their uh, so $100,000 a month is, is if you take 100,000 divided by 12, it's, it's uh, 8,333.33 times that by two and a half. For their payroll calculation, you'd want to only include, you know, max of 8,333.83 dollars per month for their pay, monthly payroll calculation. So as long as you limit it to that, now, if they're if if they come in and now so you're paying them ninety thousand or eighty thousand, well you get the eighty thousand that goes towards the cost. So there, at the end of the day, you might have a little bit of a loan in there, but you still have that employee and you've got those payments in there and and hopefully that's going to offset the good amount of that two and a half, excuse me, the PPP loan, right? The two and a half times monthly salary. So. If you wanted to, maybe there's some strategy there. Maybe you could prepay them or something like that. I don't know. So uh, during that eight, 10 weeks, eight, eight weeks, uh, eight week period. So, um, you know, so that's one thing we mentioned is, hey, if you have, if, if, if your payroll periods can, you can get three payroll periods during that eight week period, you know, because of the timing, you know, one on the very tail end. It's, in my mind that that would be included in the in the uh, payroll calculation and the loan forgiveness. So those are the types of strategies that I try to help my clients and say, okay, you know, I'm not trying to, um, I'm trying to get the spirit of the law applied to my cl my clients and and frankly non clients because the one I did this with on Saturday was not even a client. I was just suggesting a couple things that she might consider so that she can maximize her situation. Otherwise, they're going to be out of business. And that's why they did this whole stimulus package to keep small businesses going. Um, uh, yeah. You said it can be used to pay mortgage interest on debt to the PPA and it will be forgiven up to 20 sites. So you cannot use this to pay the principal part of the loan. If you can apply it to the principal and it does exceed 20, what are the consequences? Um, <clears throat> What are the consequences? Well, you just might have more on the, on the loan, right? And you might have a loan versus loan forgiveness. That's really the, the my understanding of the consequences. You have a really low rate loan and, you know, go from there. But again, the actual list, if you want me to send you an actual list of what can be used, or if you go to the SBA website, um, uh, let me just pull that up maybe if I have it here and I do. I'm trying to see this document right here. I'll pull this up right here. Hopefully you can see this. So payroll costs, including benefits, interest on mortgage obligations current before 15, February 15th, rent under lease agreements enforced before February 15th, and utilities, right? So those are your cover costs. And then your, those are the additional things, right? And then this, then here's all the costs that you can use for 
um, for your independent contractor. And again, this is on the SBA website. Um, so you, you could also pull that or if you just email us, we'll send you a copy of this particular document. It's a good document. Um, I have employees that were full time during the crisis. However, this is not reflected on the 2019 taxes due to the new years to the new hires and other issues. Can I get their full pay covered during the next eight weeks with the calculations taken last year's gross pay? It isn't working out to pay them. Um, so you're you're locked into either the two, not 2019 taxes necessarily that may not match with um, what was actually paid because uh, by the way this you should be on a pay a, a cash basis for payments my is my understanding this is all based on what was actually paid in 2019 or if you're seasonal then it's that period that was mentioned previously um can i get their full pay covered during the next eight weeks with the calculations taken last year's gross pay it isn't working out to pay them I am not sure what you're asking on this. Maybe Megan, if you understand that, maybe you can clarify. I'll move on for the moment. We are being told that there is another qualification about average annual size standards used for construction. Have you heard anything about this? We thought it was all supposed to be based on employees. I have not seen any other uh, qualification on that. Um, maybe with regard to the EIDL loan, but not the Paycheck Protection Program loan. Um, so Megan fixed last gross pay isn't working out to pay them. Can I get the full pay covered during the next eight weeks with the calculation taken last year's gross pay? It isn't working out to pay them. I'm still not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. Um, maybe Megan, if she understands it, she can chime in here. Um, <clears throat> do you anticipate many venture back companies will be excluded from their participation in the PPP? For example, of a company that has venture capital investors owning more than 20% of the company, will employees from their other portfolio holdings be included in the 500 employee count? Right now, that's the big that's a big issue for uh, venture backed companies is the affiliation rules, and so uh, it really wasn't addressed. And um, we're, we're asking, they've asked for more clarification on that. So right now it is a problem. So um, I don't know on that, you know, really how to respond to you on that other than, you know, that has been an issue with the way with the, the, with the, way the law is written right now, they're kind of being precluded from being able to participate. So based on the affiliation rules. So the affiliation rules say that if you can control or manage other companies um, and you have control over those companies, this is a big, um, a big uh, generalization. In fact, I can read it to you. I have it right here. Um, it says here on the affiliation rules, uh, generally affiliation exists when one business controls or has the power to control another or when a third party or parties controls or has the power to control both businesses. Controls may arise through ownership, management, or other relations or interaction between the parties. So in that situation, again, there's there's um, there is what they call control, and therefore you have to add up all the employees. And if you're over 500, you would be precluded at this point in time, unless they bring us additional um, changes in the legislation. That's the way it's going to be. Um, so uh, on a previous question, uh, we're, we're going to try this again. I have employees that were full time during the crisis. However, that is not reflected on the 2019 taxes due to the new hires in 2020 and other issues. Can I get their full pay covered during the next eight weeks? With the calculation taken from last year's gross pay, it isn't working out to pay them. They weren't employees last year, so they're not in the calculation for 2019 calendar year. See below. Uh, details. OK, so this is a response from one of our uh, staff at Squire, uh, Mark Andrus. He says, in general, borrowers, he's a manager with us, he, borrowers can calculate their aggregate payroll costs using data either from the previous 12 months or from the calendar year 20, 12, 2019. For seasonal businesses, the applicant may use average monthly payroll for the period between 15, February 15th and March 1st 
or March 1st. That's the 10 or 12 weeks I was talking about and June 30th. So you take either February 15th or March 1st through June 30th, figure out which one gives you the best average month payroll and use that one. An applicant that was not in business on on February 15th, 2019 to June 2019, 30th, 2019 may use the average monthly pair cost for the period January 1 through February 29, 2020. So that might help your situation. Borrowers may use their average employment over the same time periods to determine their numbers of employees for the purposes of applying an employee-based st size standard. Alternatively, borrowers may elect to use the SBA's usual calculation, the average number of employees pay period in the 12 months completed calendar year runs prior to the date of the loan application, or the average number of employees for each of the pay periods that the business has been operational, if it has not been operational for 12 months. So that gives you a little more flavor or options on those calculations. Again, I, if, if you can, the premise here is, if there's not a huge variance in your payroll calculation, you know, obviously in this situation there is, I would recommend going with whatever is the easiest to get this information. Um, and hopefully there's not a huge variance because it would seem to me that you're 20, you know, you might, you should be able to get all the information, but 2019 might be easiest. But if obviously that's not available to you or it's not beneficial for you at all because you're seasonal, then use one of these other methods. Again, contact us. We can help you with those other methods uh, to help you with your seasonal business. <clears throat> what are the requirements to prove substantial economic injury, injury to be eligible for the EIDL? Um, it's basically an attestation. Basically, you're representing that you were injured. So, uh, you know, you can calculate that probably a number of different ways. Your revenues declined significantly be due to the coronavirus. Um, you can't work. You have a mandate that you can't work. Um, you know, so the, an, any number of things could be uh, the reasons why you don't, you, you know, that you were affected negatively by the coronavirus. Conversely, other companies, you know, there's a lot of companies out there, a number of companies, I shouldn't say a lot, a number of companies, uh, their business sales have gone up. So people in ph pharmaceuticals, their business may have gone up um, because now people are looking for, you know, ways to keep their immune system up. Um, is it required to reduce or adjust the payroll amount that will be declared on the scheduled liabilities for the EIDL application? Can we declare that we are keeping the payroll amount and not reduce it given the total payroll is under 100K? Is it required to reduce, adjust the payroll amount that we declare on this? Someone's going to have to help me on that. I'm not sure. Maybe Mark or Megan can jump on that one. Okay. Oh, so Shane, he's over our, Shane Edwards. He's over our entire COVID discussion, and he said that he believes that the SBA waived the criteria requirements, the credit criteria uh, elsewhere. So in other words, you, on the EIDL loans, the, if you could have got a loan elsewhere, they waived that requirement. Now that was, I've heard that as well. And again, I went to the website and um, wasn't quite sure on that. Just know that on the EIDL, it is a little bit st stricter. Um, requirements than the PPP and so and you could be um, denied just based on their criteria but um, yeah I, I actually had read that too and um, so that that is a good clarifying point okay the the guidelines currently provide a 25 percent cushion on maintaining payroll expense during the eight-week period so right now we're just saying if you're within 75 percent this goes back to the other person's question that if you're within 75% of your previous payroll, that you're gonna, you know, be okay with not getting hit with that reduction. Again, that's where I think the clarifying regs will come out and just stipulate exactly the way to calculate that. So, um, so hopefully, you know, the, the final guidelines on this matter will um, be within that and will allow for some variance in that and in, in what you have to continue to pay employees. So to me, it makes sense that you would have a cushion there because, you know, you're just trying to survive. So if you're reducing people's payrolls, you shouldn't get dinged up by that. You should be 
glad that they're still on your payroll and that you're still paying them. So another point, just clarifying uh, statement is, well, we, Shane says, I believe the headcount number in the applications is either a full-time equivalent employed 1120 to 229 or by 215th. So there's two measurement through 215 through June 30th if you're seasonal. The choice is the applicants. So again, you have a couple of ways to measure that. Um, so we should get there. This uh, other clear, a couple other clarifying points. The certification on the PPP loan application states current economic concerning makes the loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the applicant. So that's relative to, you know, um, your saying, yes, this says the economy has affected us negatively and you need the loan so that you can continue and your, so your business can continue. Okay, so Treasury stated last night, and this is from Brandon, one of our tax partners. Uh, Treasury stated last night in fr frequently asked questions released that the county should use gross wages. Just confirming that, right? So that's what we've said throughout, and that was my belief is is that we want everything to be uh, on the gross, and and we believe that's the correct answer. So and that's what I've been telling our our clients. That's what we've maintained. So hopefully that helps. Um, and I've got some humish questions from people that I, I, I wonder who they are, but uh, we'll pass on those at this point. Okay, if uh, there are no other questions, um, Megan, is that it? It looks like we just got two more in, so I'm adding them right now to the list. Says one says, okay, will we will applying for both the PPP and the EIDL keep me from getting one? No, I don't believe so. The one PPP is is going to happen a lot quicker than the EIDL, and then I don't. As long as you're not applying for the cost that you're incurring for the PPP, you cannot double up on them on the EIDL, right? So you just need to make sure that you're, they're not the same cost. But one should not preclude. From preclude you from getting the other. Okay, so to go along with what you just said, that maybe we can just write it out and won't use all of the funds. How would we repay and or decline all the funds requested on the PPP? So I, my thought there would be that you don't. You just take the entire amount of the funds, keep those. It's at such a low low interest rate, right? If you don't if you don't use them. You're supposed to use them, and that's what it's based on. But if you don't yet, because you re had a reduction in force, you furloughed, in furloughed employees, and so your costs are less, and you don't use all those, you know, funds uh, in 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 the operations of your company subsequent to that alone origination date, and that's fine. I mean, you you keep that, and if you don't use them, then you can. And, and therefore you, you have a loan on the books because now your loan forgiveness component is less. You're gonna um, you're gonna just have a loan on your books. So, but take the money, that's the amount that you applied for. Keep it on, keep it uh, one percent rate for two years. You know, you, it's just to me, it's a, a good way to take a look at it and say, do I need this? It's kind of a security uh that you have you know something that you, just a safety measure that you're taking and then you can just pay that loan back whenever you know you think oh, i'm i'm pretty safe that would be my suggestion is is just take that money don't i wouldn't close it up front i would i would take the money and then just kind of evaluate it you can always pay and then you know go through your calculations on loan forgiveness and then any excess yeah you could pay it back whenever you're ready to pay that back so that'd be my question or my answer, excuse me. Okay, I think those are all our questions. Um, hopefully that this has been beneficial for all of you. Um, again, please reach out to our team. Anybody on our team would be happy to help out. I think we're, we're got a good track record of responding within 24 hours and um, we're here at, at your service. And any way we can help you in your business, we'd love to do that. Uh, we have an awesome team. We have great people that can help you um, navigate these rough waters that we have right now. Thank you, and uh, we look forward to talking to you soon about other other items that we have out there. Um, maybe I could touch on that just real quickly.
Um, in the future, we're going to be talking about the employee retention credit, deferment of payroll taxes, net operate, operating losses, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which we've already talked about a little bit, but I think there'll be more questions as people employ people again, and now that now they're subject to some new rules, we, we probably are going to go over that again. So there's and there's numerous more things that are in the act and outside the act. Um, for instance, there was a small bridge loan that was available to small businesses by the state of Utah. Um, the application period's passed, but a second round po is possible. And, and so I'd urge you to check on coronavirus.utah.gov and look at uh, the resources available to you there. Um, so there's all sorts of things that are out there right now. And we just like want to encourage you to keep checking with us on our website and watch for our newsletters. And um, we're here to help you and you should be fairly comfortable that we are on top of this and that we can give you the, the right information. And uh, again, thank you for attending and we'll talk to you later.